Hello and welcome to First Look, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading or readings for the coming Sunday. My name is Carl and it's really good to have you with us. This week we're going to be looking at one of the parables in Matthew's Gospel, namely the parable of the sower. Before we dive into that, however, if you've not done so already, you might find it useful to download the sheet that accompanies this study. And you can find the link to that in the video description in YouTube. On the sheet, you will find the text of today's reading, some other passages you may wish to look up, the questions we'll be considering together later on, and lots of room for you to record your own thoughts and observations. And so then, without further ado, let's dive into this week's passage, which comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 1 to 9, and then 18 to 23. Jesus was, we learn in Matthew chapter 12, still in the Galilean phase of his ministry, and being followed, as we learn in verse 15, by huge crowds of people. And he found himself, as we see particularly verses 22 to 45, caught in controversy with the Pharisees, some of whom accused him of being demon-possessed and saying that's why Jesus was able to cast out demons. And they demanded he perform some sort of sign, apparently to reassure them about who he was. He then scandalised the crowds that had been gathered around him by reacting to his mother and his brothers seeking him out, by declaring that those who do the will of the one who sent him, God the Father, are his mother and sister and brothers. No, not father. And that meant that he was putting loyalty to God above blood ties, which given how important family ties were to the people of Israel, familial relationships were thought to mirror the relationship between God and the people, this was a big deal. That's chapter 12, verses 46 to 50. Now we're told that the action in today's passage begins on the same day as all of that happened, with Jesus staying in a house seemingly close to the Sea of Galilee, as implied by chapter 13, verse 1. And we don't know exactly where this occurred, but it was probably somewhere on the sh near to the shore of Galilee, just to the west of Capernaum. So in this passage, we obviously have Jesus, and he was teaching the crowd of people gathered around him using parables. And in the bit that the lectionary this week misses out, in chapter 13, verses 10 to 17, we see the disciples questioning Jesus about his use of parables as a teaching tool. The crowd of disciples get private explanations of some of the parables, including today's parable of the sower. And this group of disciples certainly included, but probably was not limited to, the twelve that Jesus had called, as we saw in chapter 10, verses 2 to 4, with a list of names. And we've also got these expectant crowds gathered around Jesus and desperate to hear what he had to say to the extent, as we'll see, that Jesus had to take to a boat in order to be able to address them safely. Now Matthew's Gospel was the second of the canonical Gospels to be written, likely around 75 to 80 of the Common Era. So after the fall of Jerusalem and its temple in the year 70, they were destroyed by the Romans, which had a profound effect on Jewish religious identity. And Matthew's is the most overtly Jewish of the four Gospels, which has an impact on how Matthew presents matters. But I think here, perhaps the most significant detail is the fact that Mark's Gospel, we know, was one of the sources for Matthew's Gospel. So in today's passage, where we've got a parable followed by an explanation, we may want to take a look at that earlier version. We might want to look, therefore, at Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 1 to 20, 
which also has this interlude where the disciples asked why Jesus uses parables and also offers an explanation. There are other passages from Matthew's Gospel that give us examples of the kinds of things Jesus is alluding to in this parable. So if we look, for example, at Matthew 3.19, we find one example of someone just not understanding the Gospel. And this is something that particularly the religious leaders that Jesus was in conflict with seem to do again and again. And it's not a coincidence, I think, that this parable comes hot on the heels of that kind of conflict with the Pharisees. We might also look at chapter 9, verse 8, chapter 15, verse 31, or chapter 21, verses 8 to 9, to find examples of people who initially responded well to Jesus, particularly to Jesus' healings, but then turned away when the religious authorities uh, got their hat together, as it were, and put Jesus in peril. And we also see, if we jump ahead to chapter 26, verses 69 to 75, that even the disciples who made up that inner core of Jesus' closest friends would either betray or deny or flee when the chips were down. And we may also want to look at Matthew 19, verses 17 to 22, that give us the story of the character who's become known as the rich young ruler. He's a really good example of someone whose faith was choked by the thorns and weeds of wealth and worldly worry. So for Dale Allison, in his very helpful commentary on this passage, the content of the whole of Matthew 13 serves to go some way to explain why it was that the Messiah was rejected by some of the people of Israel. And thus it naturally follows on from that conflict in chapters 11 and 12. We find Jesus sitting by the lake when large crowds come and gather around him, forcing him, as we learn in verses 1 and 2 of today's reading, to take to a boat in order to avoid being crushed. Now, if you visit the Sea of Galilee, uh, on the shore of the lake, just to the west of Capernaum, there are various little inlets. And if you sail out a little way into the lake and talk back to the people on the, on the beach, as it were, the acoustics are, are absolutely excellent. It was the case in Jesus' day, it's still the case today, if you visit that part of Israel-Palestine. So Jesus would have been heard very clearly by his audience. And I say the fact that we can still experience this phenomenon today gives it some veracity. Now in verse 3 we learn that Jesus taught the crowds many things in parables. And indeed there are seven parables of Jesus that are given to us in Matthew 13. And the implication of verse 3 is that this was Jesus' typical mode of teaching. Now the term parable literally means to throw alongside. So one entity is thrown alongside something else to be illuminated by that comparison. And in this case, generally what's being illuminated is the life of the kingdom of God. Though Jesus doesn't use the formula here about to what shall we compare the kingdom of God, for example. He just dives straight in to the parable. So this has a slightly different beginning to some of them. Now, the parable of the sower, by beginning with Jesus saying, listen, in verse 3, effectively begins by him saying, listen up and take notice. And that will be repeated in verse 9, where Jesus says, let those who have ears listen. I have to say, I was thinking ears of wheat, ears of corn, and wondering if there was some kind of wordplay there. Uh, but I think the, the important thing here is that we really need to pay attention. Jesus is highlighting that this is important, indeed important enough for us to see it explained to the disciples in verses 18 to 23. One of the very rare occasions where Jesus offers an explanation of an allegorical parable. Having said that, his sit up and take notice effectively 
highlights how he didn't spoon feed the crowds what they were supposed to take from the parables. And indeed, we don't see Jesus explaining every last thing to the disciples. They too need to chew these stories over and sit with them and think and perhaps have their minds changed and their preconceptions challenged. Now, key to this parable, still with verse three, is the extravagance we see of the seed scattering. I've got into gardening in recent years. And one of the things I've learned is the need to be careful with how you plant the seeds to make sure they're sufficiently far apart and in the right kind of soil as far as you can in the garden you've got to, and so forth. Whereas the sower here just throws them about extravagantly, abundantly. And it reminds us, I think, that God will keep sowing seeds of grace, even in the most apparently unlikely places. And even, therefore, in the heart of the disciples who were being given the private explanation later on. Now, as we've already noted, it's not difficult to find examples of people who behave like what's implied by the three unhelpful, as it were, types of soil in verses four to seven. The hard ground, the pathways where nothing will grow, the rocky ground where things will grow very well initially and then wither when the sun kicks in because they don't have deep roots. And those that are choked off by thorns and weeds that don't allow them to, to grow. Those who are most like the good soil that Jesus talks about in verse 8 are, I think, in Matthew's presentation, often the most unlikely of people. For example, the tax collectors, sinners and prostitutes of chapter 21, verses 31 to 32. In Matthew's Gospel, there's an emphasis in chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, on what you do for the least of these, in worldly terms, you do for me. And I think it's there where we're talking about people who might be considered the least of these, where we see a good soil naturally occurring. Now, when Jesus goes on to explain this parable to his disciples, he talks about the seed as the word of the kingdom. That's verse 19. And I think thereby he identifies himself as the sower in this parable, which mirrors what we've seen in chapter 4, verse 23 and chapter 9, verse 35, for instance. Now we note the role of the evil one or the devil that's mentioned in verse 19 as well as in later parables, for example, in chapter 13, verse 39. And the Satan here is portrayed as one who leads astray. If we go back to Matthew chapter 4 and Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, we find the Satan kind of whispering, tempting thoughts in his head, trying to lead him astray from the calling that he'd been given at his baptism. And I wonder if it's essentially the same thing here, this kind of little voice in our, in our heads that tempts us away from the path that Jesus would lead us along. Elizabeth Johnson, in her very helpful commentary, talks about how we've each got all four of these types of soil in our own hearts. And so what Jesus is not saying here is we need to strive to make ourselves like the good soil, as if we can somehow redeem or transform ourselves by our own efforts. Rather, we need to be open to the Spirit's work within us, because it's God who transforms by continuing to graciously scatter wildly the seed of grace and love and transformation. So I think the parable of the sower and the fact that Jesus explains it to his disciples is quite fascinating. And to help us delve a bit more deeply into it, we now turn to our questions for this week.